Having had his own National Tonight Show and a stand-up comedy and radio career spanning decades, Richard Stubbs knows a thing or three about how to conduct a great interview that holds an audience's attention. And that's exactly what he shares with you and I in episode 392. Before we get stuck into today's episode of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, the marketing gold is made possible thanks to Prosper and American Express. Prosper is Australia's number one online lender to small businesses. You can quickly apply online for loans up to $250,000, get a fast decision, and in most cases, receive the funding in under 24 hours. Call 1300 882 867. And you got to love it when your business expenses reward you. When you apply for an American Express Business Explorer credit card by November 30, 2017, and spend $3,000 in the first three months from the card approval date, you'll receive a bonus, wait for it, 100,000 membership reward points. Search Amex Business to find out how. New American Express card members only. Terms and conditions apply. <laughs> I always wanted to do that. I said, welcome to a small business marketing show Where successful small business owners share their souls To take your marketing straight to the lead Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie And welcome back to the Small Business Big Marketing Show I'm your host, Timbo Reed, you, infinitely more importantly, are a motivated business owner ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. Big show today. Richard Stubbs, Australian TV and radio royalty, will masterclass you and I in the art and science of conducting an engaging interview. And before you turn off thinking, hey, Timbo, this one's not for me, Well, it is if content marketing is a part of how you attract more customers, and it should be. I'll show you how to exponentially increase your customer base, and we go back into the vault, revisiting a chat I had with crowdfunding expert and Orbit Key inventor Rex Quo. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ, so let's get stuck right in. Got a bit of an update for you shortly on the outcome of that viral used Honda video, which I talked about in the bonus episode I put out a few days ago. But I've got to tell you, you and I will be meeting some pretty inspiring business peeps over the coming weeks. Sunraysia prune juice owner Dan Presser will explain why and how he builds brands and really successful brands using only radio. 15-year-old entrepreneur Will Deeth shares how he's already made hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes, I said 15 years old. And we'll catch up with a CRM specialist who'll explain why and how to embrace that cool new marketing software that can skyrocket your leads and conversions. Hey, you might have noticed a couple of new sponsors have come on board in the past few weeks, specifically Prosper and American Express, and that past sponsor Design Crowd is back for more small business big marketing goodness. Well, here's the thing. I only ever choose sponsors I know you'll benefit from. And don't worry, I've knocked back a few on your behalf. You're welcome. I get that in an ideal world, you'd love a sponsor-free podcast, But you know as well as I do that support makes this show happen. It also enables me to utilise a great editor, thanks Daz, and a great virtual assistant, thanks Joel, which frees me up to chase down amazing guests for you and I to learn from. Guests you're not going to hear interviewed anywhere else. So Prosper is possibly your best source of short-term business loans that get approved lightning fast. Amex's membership rewards program could have you enjoying a holiday a lot quicker than you ever thought possible. And Design Crowd gives you access to amazing designers all over the world without breaking your bank. So they're kind of pretty relevant sponsors. 
The support from these brands also frees me up to produce bonus episodes like the one I put out just a few days ago with Max Landman, who'd created that crazy viral used car video for his girlfriend's beaten up old Honda. You know, he emailed me just yesterday saying, hey, Timbo, we just sold the car to CarMax for $20,000. It was worth $1,500 at best. Uh, he, had, he said he had a fun send-off for old Greeny, which was the car's name, on Monday night with cast crew and some old friends. Isn't that great? So what am I saying? I'm saying thanks for your loyalty. Thanks for putting up with my sponsors' messages. I try to make them as fun as possible. And thanks to those who use my sponsors' products or services. <laughs> Righto, that brings us to today's guest, Richard Stubbs. Having had his own national TV Tonight Show and a stand-up comedy and radio career spanning decades, Richard knows a thing or two about how to conduct a great interview that holds an audience's attention. I used to listen to Richard on ABC Radio, where he hosted the afternoon show for nine years. Gee, it was a good show. And I've always loved the conversational nature of his interviews. He's got this innate ability to get you to lean in and really listen to what he's talking about and what his guests are sharing. So why am I dedicating an entire episode to the topic of how to become a great interviewer? Simple. I want to get better at it myself. (laughs) And I also see a lot of you embarking on a content marketing strategy for your business that includes blogging, podcasting, and video content. And each of these mediums are made for interviewing experts. So if you're going to do it, You may as well do it really, really well, right? Now, I'm pretty transparent in this interview. Whilst I get great feedback from a lot of you that you enjoy my interviewing style, thank you, I know that I've got a long, long way to go. So I asked Richard to pull me up wherever he sees me getting it wrong. (laughs) And there were a couple of places I was getting it wrong, trust me. I think he was actually pretty kind. Uh, And there's a couple of warnings on this chat. The S-bomb is dropped a few times. So get the kids uh, out of the room, get the toys out, the Lego, the Play-Doh, and there is also a bit of a fanboy alert. I couldn't help it. I'm interviewing one of my idols. (laughs) I love Richard Stubbs. We pick up the conversation just after Richard enters the studio. What I'd love you to do is um, pull me up when I kind of do something that you go, you know, you wouldn't do that in an interview. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've just given him permission to... Uh... Seems, seems wrong. <laughs> why? I don't know. It's your gig. It's yeah, your yeah, gig. But, 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 but you know why? I'm, yeah, I get I'm, the I'm, idea. I've chosen, you know, you're, an, you're <clears throat> someone whose interviewing skills I've respected for years. So Thank you. I would love to be able to, you know, get pulled up and go, you know what? Being a bit of a dickhead there. Or, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. Don't think I'm going to say that, but okay. Um, is that glare annoying? No. Nah. Uh, is 40 foot, it's as long as it needs to be. Is I don't 40 care, man. cool? Yeah, I'm, Man, I'm here I love now. it. Do you do anything else in your life? Not really. It's this great. is it. Great. So, <laughs> uh, I often start an interview uh, with an icebreaker. I might uh, say something like, so Richard, welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, and what's the, what's the biggest animal you could knock out with one punch? To break the ice, to establish rapport. Uh, is that a good or a bad idea? Uh, it's not a bad idea. Um, it's just wrong time. Um, I, uh, I drop something. I might swear. I might uh, say something uh, that pushes a boundary. I might do that kind of thing. But it's off air early after I've met the person. And it's before the interview starts because I want to see which way they're going to jump. So... If uh, if I do if I do something that's a little out of left field, I want to see which way they're going to jump, and that will inform how I'm going to run my questions during the interview. The way you do it, I've kind of uh, committed because if they freeze and it goes really badly, well, we've started the interview shit. So it's better to do what you're doing. The idea is right, but to do it off air and to do it early and to monitor the person like everything. We, we should probably talk about 
the notion of what you're doing in an interview and all that kind of stuff because I feel like the first question is already about ten things into the interview. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I get that. But I, I, I put that question there because it's like, well, normally I'd start with an icebreaker. I'm not going to start with it. I just want to establish whether it's a good or a bad idea. <laughs> so what you're saying is um, by all means break the ice yeah, yeah. by f- asking a fun question of your guest but do it off air and get a read on where they go with it. Correct. Do they have fun? Do they yeah. freeze? So therefore, and I will come back to pre-interview, but therefore what's the notion, What's the nature of your first question? Is so it, it could be it, anything. Look, um, depending on who you're interviewing, uh, if I'm doing interviews, it might be someone who's on their 40th interview for the day. So maybe they're promoting a film or something and, and they've come out and they're just, you're just a blank. So what is the unique content you're going to get out of that person? What is the thing that's going to make your interview more listenable than the other 39 that he, she's done? So one of the ways to achieve that is to cut through to the person, to wake them up. So I push them. And uh, not physically, but, I mean, I say something odd. I catch their attention. I, what? Mm -hmm. Uh, What? And see which way they they go on it. Mm -hmm. Um, The critical thing to be looking at uh, with any interview is uh, body language. You know, 80% of our communication is nonverbal. So... How did the person walk in? Where was their eye line? What was their handshake like? Was there a handshake? Uh, what were they carrying? What did the, how did they hold themselves? Where did they stand? How did they sit? All of those things are tells that tell you about what the person's feeling, what mood they're in, how you're going to strike a rapport and get this thing running. Wow. What to look for, listen for. Well, yeah, because, uh, look, the person you're interviewing, think of yourself as a safe cracker. And the person you're interviewing is a safe and you've got a couple of minutes before the alarm goes off. Nice. So you need to get their combination. And you do that. The interview starts from the moment you see them, before they've seen you even, if it's, you know, glass mm-hmm. door and all that kind of stuff. So the interview started. And you're watching them and you're measuring them and you're going, okay, so what's going on with this person? Where's their head at? What are they thinking? And all of that. You're, you're dealing uh, historically with a lot of people who are interview friendly, or sure. at least they've done hundreds, right? Yeah. Uh, often, in my case, uh, and in the case of people listening, they're interviewing people who just haven't been interviewed. So I've done that too, and and they're uh, even bigger. You know, I, I interviewed a lot of veterans, and uh, so these are people who I'm getting to tell a story that they probably haven't even told their family, and they're not professionals. And is, I always used to say, I never get nervous interviewing big stars I could care less about them. And they're professionals at what they do. They don't give a crap about me. And I honestly don't care about I've them. I, I just don't. I, I mean, <laughs> they're fine. Some of them are really nice people and some of them aren't and whatever. The interviews where you're interviewing a civilian, particularly about a trauma, these are really important, challenging interviews. And so you are even more working, I am anyway, to be... Uh, aware of the nuances of the body language and to pick up and to repeat language. And one of the ways um, one of the ways that you get a good interview out of someone who's not used to it is to know everything about what they're talking about. Mm. So you need to do your research. You need to have done... I had this recurring nightmare that I'm doing an interview where I don't know anything. Um, and we used to do it occasionally... Because I did so many interviews in 11 years with the ABC, the, um, <coughs> apart from all the other things I, I've done in interviews, the, um, uh, we used to do things occasionally that uh, we'd have a guest come on and I just have to work out who they are through conversation. But we'll talk about that a little later maybe because that's kind of a different headspace about it. But in general, you need to know everything about the person because you've got to lead them. So you're almost... When, they, when they're not professional at their story, you need to give them little hooks to Mm -hmm. go, oh, your business started 10 years ago, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right, 10 years. Geez, 10 years ago, the market was very different. Well, it was. Here's the other thing you've got to do. When you're interviewing someone who's not a professional, uh, you've got to listen. Can I can I just put listening on hold because mm. I know how important I, I hear it all the time. Sure. I think it's important. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Um, the people that I'm interviewing, and again, those who are listening are interviewing, they're not interview savvy. 
Um, we don't, we the business owners, don't necessarily have the resource to go and find out everything about them. Now, do you... There's this thing called the internet. No, no, I get that. No, I totally get that. The resources there, the yeah. time is maybe not be there. So is your view, well, don't do it? Or, so like I've got an interview after you today. Oh, uh, okay. It's a business owner. Yeah. Um, I have spoken to his coach yep. because she was a guest on this show a few weeks ago. She's given me some insight into him. I've had a pre-interview with him. I feel like I know enough for it to be a very good interview. Okay. Now I'm thinking maybe I'm kidding myself. Maybe I should know intimately his timeline of business success so that if he doesn't mention something, I pull it out of him. Maybe. <laughs> if it's, see, here's the thing. I, I think you have to go back to radio principles here. Uh, what makes me listen to what you're doing? What's the interesting thing? You should be asking yourself about an interview and about any content. Is this the best that I can put on air? And if it isn't, get it off. Yeah, I love that. And if it is, good. doesn't mean that there's not better stuff coming, you know, after the break, Mel Gibson. But right now, <laughs> this is the best stuff we've got. So if it isn't the very best stuff that you're putting to air, then don't put it to air. So can I just... I, I, so just to go, to, to put that in the in the framework of what you're talking about, yep. it's hard for me to answer the question because I don't know what you think is interesting about this person. Yep. Why are you talking to someone? Why will I, the listener, give a crap? What yep. makes me? This is why often when you're on radio, you should talk in terms of you. So when you're, you, as in you're talking to your audience going... Uh, you'll know our next guest because you've seen his business and you've probably used it, but you've never understood what it takes to get a business like that spread from one shop to 10 shops to nationwide. And we're going to unpick his brain today and you're going to find out. Yeah, I love that. So what you're telling me is something that uh, I'm interested in. So it's less about the anecdotes and about the nuances. Japanese saying, um, study technique, practice technique. Forget technique. <laughs> so you learn how to do a thing. You practice it so much that it becomes a conditioned reflex. And then when you're doing it, you don't think about it. So in your research, you're looking for the bits that are interesting. You're not necessarily going to sit in an exam where I would need you to list his entire timeline, but I need you to know the interesting bits in the timeline. I need you to be able to look down the timeline and go, huh, look at that. His business posted a profit that year when the interest rates were at 20%. How the crap did he do that? Yeah. Uh, these things, the things that with practice you go, you know what, that's going to be an interesting story. That's why did he do it like that? Why is that there? Yeah, that okay. kind of stuff. Oh, I just want to go back to pre-interview. Okay. I'm sort of timelining this. I'm sort of not. I've got a yeah, list of questions here fine. that go left, right and centre. Um, no, I don't care. When uh, you kindly agreed to do this interview, I said, well, mm. can we do a pre-interview? You said no because you've done lots of interviews. Uh, as I walked out of the pub that night, uh, I was like, you know, that pre-interview was actually for me. It wasn't for Richard <laughs> because I, I mean, and I completely get it. You don't need to figure out what we're going to, you know what we're going to talk about, how to nail a great interview. Uh, I wanted to do a pre-interview because I wanted to structure it. I wanted to go, do you want to go from the pre-interview to interview to post-interview or whatever and, and talk about that? Um, is that an important thing to do? to establish? And I do a five-minute pre-interview with every guest, hear their voice, establish rapport, they get a sense of what I'm about. In, uh, in the world of radio, it's the, what a producer would do. So a producer would contact the guest and say, you're right to come on and tell me a bit about, and okay, okay. So I, I think, therefore, that it's a great thing to be doing when you're a one-person operation. Just don't overdo it. Don't, don't put all your best shots in the practice oh, no. ring. You, no. know, the, you need it to be short. I think the key word there was five minutes. Yep. And you need to be quite quite um, specific about what you need to get out of this. You need to get that tell, find out which way this person jumps, what's the sound of their voice, are they really boring at speaking, yep. are they a monotone, have they got a high-pitched nasal whine, what, what is going on, uh, just from the sound of it because it's audio. And also giving yourself uh, just background to things. And some of, uh, some of that pre-interview might just be, Mate, uh, what do you think is important about your business? Yep. Like big general questions and then pick up on the nature of their answers. And, and that's exactly what I do. And I find myself the most common thing I say in a pre-interview phone call is keep your powder dry because what they do is they go into the story and I'm like, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah, don't tell don't, me the story. Don't tell me the story. I yeah. want the element of surprise Correct. to remain. Is it okay as we go in an interview to 
not maintain eye contact because particularly this interview, I've got questions that I really just want to make sure I cross off. Sure. Other interviews I feel like I'm just going to have a conversation and we're just going to lock eyes and we're just as if we're at a pub. Both. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, it's not a staring contest. I it think feels it's... weird that I'm looking down. Uh, no, you're working. It's not, yeah. not a weird, Tim, what'd you do with the money? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, it's not one of those. I, um, <laughs> Richard looked to his left. Yeah, that's right. I looked up. Yeah. And uh, so I don't think it's one of those. I, and sometimes sometimes I don't make eye contact if I'm going to ask something that I think's personal. So I just did it then because I don't – got resting bitch face and I don't want to <laughs> – I don't want to be staring at someone necessarily. Maybe I want to let them. Maybe my sense of the person is I'm, they'll talk easier if it's they're not feeling under the glare of it. Yeah, yeah. So use it like any other tool. We, I, it is important to make eye contact. That's kind of weird to talk to someone who uh, sits and talks out a window. Yeah, but I, I have also heard Although you say that. in an, in another interview where you are so all you're doing is listening. We're going to come to listening, but you're, all you're doing is listening. You're looking down at your notes. You're, you're scribbling stuff down. Your guest is talking, and so tragically, that wasn't the guest talking. That was my partner. Um, <laughs> it was too much, too long on radio. No, I don't do it in an interview like that. God no. <sighs> but uh, you, when you've got talkback calls, they're coming through your headphones. So you're kind of just staring at nothing, maybe making notes to yourself or lining up the next call or whatever, but you're all about your ears and what's going through. So, <laughs> so I found myself, one of the radio habits, found myself, my partner would be telling me something important and I'd just be looking at, down at the table just really listening to the sound of her voice like it's a talkback caller. And she goes, are you even listening? And I'm going, babe, that's all I'm doing. She goes, well, could you look at... Oh, yeah, sorry, I've got out of the habit of that. <laughs> but then I also hook my family through. So just right. before dinner I go... You'll never believe what happened at work today and how I found 50 bucks, all that and a whole lot more when I'm back from the toilet. <laughs> and uh, they're like, I love Could it. you not? You take the boy out of radio, but know, you can't right? take radio out of the boy. Yes. You mentioned resting bitch face before. Now, it's one of the, one of your great routines. Um, because this is audio yeah. and because this is going global uh, and there are people who go like, who is Richard Stubbs? Do I need to pull you up? And, and have you explained that or do we just let it go? Always explain. Uh, pull up is bad yeah. if someone's in a flow. So I think uh, uh, it happens resting, to be- resting bitch face is, is I think, a common phrase, so people will work it out. But in, in terms of the question, I think you go, I think you can, rather than pull them up, you can just clarify. So you go, Oh, resting, but oh, Tim, that's where your face is uh, always looking like you're cross, right? So, like, you're agreeing with them. See how I'm paralleling? Yeah. So, I'm not going, oh, mate, I'll stop you there. Let me just explain what resting bitch face is to everyone. Okay, now on you go, like traffic cop. The other way is to go, oh, yeah, because that's like so and so. Or that's right, the interest rates were low that year, weren't they? So, you add that little bit of F, um, extra information you feel the audience needs without being a cop and stopping the traffic yeah, from right. your audience. Uh, and not immediately. Your... Like, let that let the guests go through. Pretty immediately. Oh, pretty you can't, immediately. Yeah, you can't go back and go, oh, that thing we've talked about for five minutes, let me just tell you what it is. Uh, you need uh, to jump in. Yeah. You need to slide up next to them and go, oh, yeah, because that's Paris, France. So, so how do I how do I slide in? Because I'm, I'm not I, – I can often talk over people and it annoys the hell out of me. Mm. I know it annoys my listeners. Is there a trick to jumping in? Maybe. Uh <laughs> No, it's really hard. It's hard because it's com- uh, you know a conversation has over talking, and interviews are like a conversation, but they're not quite a conversation. And it, it used to be very, it's always very difficult on radio too because uh, you you're under a time constraint. People get cross when you over talk politicians, but of course politicians know the least questions I answer is a win. So you ask them a question, they start their answer and just start saying their policy. And then it was nothing to do with the question. And then they just keep talking to fill the time. And we're out of time, thanks for the question. And they've just stated all that. So you have to over-talk them. You have to cut them off. Otherwise, this is the trick they're going to pull. So, so Other you... guests are, are not kind of so bolshy about that, but the same principle applies. Some I might have five minutes with Tim, but I know he's got this great story about the machine gun nest at WeeWAC, and uh, <laughs> so I'm, I want to know about that. But right now he's talking about what he had for lunch. So Rich, Richard's a war historian, on. by the way. So <laughs> Yeah, it may not always be that. Um, 
Yeah, so I've got to move him on to that important thing. So uh, I think because it's audio, don't overlook the power of the gesture. So let the person who's talking know, raise your eyebrow, do the finger up, as if you're calling for the check. Yeah, yeah. Bit because, of one. because one of the things with a lot of the guests that I have, again, they're not interview savvy, they don't understand the idea of giving the interviewer a little gap, a little space to go maybe he or she wants to jump in because they just go. Yeah, people trail their sentences, right? Yeah, they don't yeah, use totally. full stops. And it freaks me out because there is, there's just no way. Yeah. And, and particularly, it's like merging traffic. <laughs> Mate, just make a gap. Yeah, I know. Politicians do it deliberately. Once you know the trick, you'll hear them. Oh, mate, I hear them and, and you'll go, yeah, I see what they're doing. They are stopping the interviewer, asking that nasty question about me sexting, and they're just <laughs> uh, banging on about uh, jobs and growth. When were you sexting? I was there. It's never proved. It's <laughs> still what, before the courts. Everything we're talking about, Richard, um, it obviously doesn't apply to face-to-face as it does to phone interviews. Is there a, what's the – you can't gesture on a phone. No. Nah. Um, phone interviews are harder and worse. Yes. One of my – some of my worst interviews were on the phone. Actually, my very, one of my very worst was on the phone with two band members who were in different country uh, – oh, different cities. Your band and members that, and different cities. Yeah, and they weren't really getting on. And and I'm in the middle, and it was a band I really liked. It was Stilly Dan and these two drug fried <laughs> dicks. And I just wanted to punch them in their stupid faces yeah, right. because, mate, yeah, you're ruining my content. So um, it's, it's just a given. Phoners are tougher. Phoners are tougher because they're not as personal. I think. I think. Look, phoners are great. They're okay if you've already met the person and there's some rapport. So that's okay. Um, sometimes you just can't get them any other way than on the phone. So you need to be critically aware of over-talking on a phone. You need to just pause, use gaps. Um, the same principles apply, though, that you need to um, follow up questions by listening. You know, you listen and then that leads you to a follow-up question. And that's how you get the best out of your phones. Okay. Let's talk about the uh, conversation and listening. So is... Every interview, a conversation? Kind of. Well, it's not, is it? It's a dance. It's a performance. It's a performance. The interview's a performance, right? You're not yarn event. You're not actually chasing this person down the, the back alley with a backpack camera to expose them. You've got them on because you think your listeners will be interested in them. So you need the best out of them. So this is a dance and you're going to lead. But it's a partner dance. So... That. Think of it that way. You're not a j- hard-hitting journalist exposing Adani and all their shady dealings. You're just getting someone to work with you to provide some interesting content. Because I, it sort of sounded like a stupid question, but but what I like, I feel like I'm having a chat with you right now. Mm. But sometimes there are interviews where I've got a list of questions, and I go, okay, she's answered that. Next, next, and that to me, that's not a conversation. That's just a Q and A. Depends on what you need from the person. Uh, I need the details of the bank's policy on right. drawing down home loans. So let's just step through it. Yeah. And I might ask you, but why has the bank got that policy? Yeah. Why would you do that? Blah, blah, blah. Well, these are all kind of factual. We're going to step through the thing. But it, where it's more anecdotal or philosophical, then the style of it is conversational because it's more listenable. Okay. But even those bank ones, you can always go, do you personally feel okay about this? Personally. See, I love that. I don't know why. Why doesn't that happen more often? I was listening to some radio this morning and it was pretty factual. Mm. And, like, you know, I, didn't, I don't know what the brief was. I don't know what the, enough about what they were trying to get out of that interview. But I'm like, I was exactly like that going, yeah. where's the emotional, where's the softer question? Where's the prodding question? Where's that, the one that makes it interesting? It makes it interesting. Yeah, like, yeah. What? It's not rocket science. You, you, you go, well, why am I listening to this? If you're doing the interview, is it, you're saying, is this the best content I can get on air right now? Am I bored? If you start to get bored yeah. as the interviewer, if you start to find yourself ticking off questions, 100% your listeners are bored. Yes. So you need to be alert to that and you need to change the bowling. You know, you just got to start, toss a bouncer down there or yep. do something. Do something to wake the thing up and go throw something. You know, this is where a judgment call, because you can throw something in from left field that really pisses off the person you're interviewing and uh, straight away you get nothing. Uh, I was uh, standing with someone who works with Crown 
and they work. Um, I'll give you a great example. We're at a social function, standing with someone who works with Crown. One woman came up to us. First thing she said was, oh, hi, she said to the person I was with, um, I don't know you, but I'm good friends with your ex. Oh, well, that's not going to be a terrific conversation <laughs> we're going to have then, is it? Yeah. How great for you. Yeah. Uh, the key word in that sentence is, my ex. Why would I give two craps <laughs> about someone who's a great friend, much less, well, well now I'm going to put a lampshade on my head mm-hmm. so you can go back and tell the ex. Mm-hmm. So that's that. And then they went away and then they came back and the significance of Crown happens now because they brought the doddering old partner who said, oh, here we are and I work for Crown. And, uh, well, they're not going too well, are they, with the directors? What's going on with that? <laughs> First thing out of his mouth. It's like, well, mate, I'm not a director. Yeah, i uh, got some issues at, at, uh, at the moment. Shut up. Go away. I'm certainly not chatting. Mm-hmm. Couldn't read that the person had shut down straight away. And I just found those really interesting opening questions where on theory uh, that could be our, Tim and I were talking about changing it up and, you know, make it bold. But actually all it's done is shut them down. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be very careful, I think, in conversation that's boring. When you go to liven it up, for Christ's sake, (laughs) don't sink the boat by trying to make it exciting by rocking it. Mm. So it's a balancing act. You know, you've got to take a bit of a punt. So, okay, you say, and I hear it a lot, you've got to listen. Now, when you started the Crown conversation then, I was actually having a conversation with myself as to why is Richard got headphones on, mm. <laughs> right? Uh, and I lost the start of that story. And so I guess listening is important because I feel like I could have kind of contributed more to that story if I had been listening. So yeah. is, is yeah. listening... Like, I hear it all the time. Got to listen. What do you got to listen for? Okay, a couple of things, mate. If uh, someone's, uh, all sorts of people are telling you the same thing, you you might want to take their advice. Right. So, I mean, thank you for being honest and sharing that. Despite everyone telling you listening is important, you're going, huh? Headphones, yeah. they're a thing. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Might want to work on that. Do some yoga, meditation. I got it. Something that focuses your mind a little for more than five seconds. Just, you know, don't try to extend your concentration range out. <laughs> um, why is it important? Because you've done a list of questions that you think will be interesting. But the person's dropping stuff. Like, you know, how long have you been doing stand-up, Richard? Oh, I've been doing stand-up for quite some time. I remember one of my early gigs was presenting to Charles and Diana. And, and then I went on and did pubs and clubs. And, and I, I worked overseas. And you could... Did, did you just say Charles and Diana? Is that true? Yeah. And, um, true and cool story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, and Nelson Mandela. So there you go. Early. Mm. Like how in... Well, he was out of jail. Digression. Here we go. Is it okay to digress? I don't know. How do you get an interview, early man. gig in front of the Prince and Princess of Wales? Yeah. Um, uh, so I was the only comedian on a, on a band night with In Excess and the models and I'm talking and... No. Yep. Met now, them both. Do you want to just talk 80s? Yeah, sure. Hey, why don't we do that? <laughs> I think there's a podcast. I actually tweeted only recently. Uh, no one's done a podcast on 80s. It just needs to be done. Yes. So, so you were the only comedian mm. on, on that. And, and what was it? Was it a Royal Variety performance? Yeah, yeah. Royal Variety performance. Yeah, yeah. They Opera were, House? They were here. No, uh, here at the Art Centre and broadcast out on big screens to Fed that, Square. That and must have like that. Um, been a real influence on your... You mean, what a confidence booster. I mean, sort everything of. from there is... Well, it's like everything else, you know. Um, all gigs are gigs. And, uh, yeah, like anything that you do, any business, any any risk, uh, there are great rewards and there are huge risk. So, yes. Yeah, it's like Did you everything. nail it? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it went quite well. As Charles himself said, well, that really wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. He did not. He did. That were his words. It's a bit rude. <laughs> He's a king, almost. So, so we just digressed to a place where, well, it gave a, a greater insight to the you, the guest, uh, but it was irrelevant to the topic of how to nail an interview. Was that a good thing to do? Uh, yeah, it makes it a little interesting if we're getting dry and dull. Uh, yeah. The other thing, too, is that we talked earlier about watching body language for tells, um, the way people tell stories, and if they continually reference a feeling or a, uh, an event in other stories, then chances are that feeling or event is important to them. Yep. So then you make a choice as the interviewer, so will we explore that or mm-hmm. will I just note it? I note that you get really angry when I mention X, you know, the, 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 and so it's up to you. Yeah. Again, we go back to the safe cracker analogy. Is that part of the combination or have you just noted it and 
you use it in some other way. When digressing as the interviewer, do you go, hey, listen, we're just going to digress for a minute. I really want to find out more about the Princess uh, Diana thing. I or, think or that, that you... Uh, if you say the word digress, it breaks the third wall thing. Go, wow, that's amazing. Also, too, uh, rule of radio, yeah, just say it. Well, if I could digress for a moment and just check in on what you just said there, I'd like to go, wow, Charles and Diana, what was that like? Get into it. Get in. Oh, my God, get into it. Uh, I'd like to grab most announcers and say, please, just get into the story. Beautiful day out there, you know. I'm reminded <laughs> of the clouds and how bright they are. And the other day I was in a plane. Mate, come on. Get into the story. Make me interested. My hand's quivering at the button to change to another Yeah, channel. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, you know, for the radio scene at the moment, uh, Smooth FM is rating. And I think that everyone who's on air has to just go into the room of mirrors and go, my content is so shit. Yeah. Smooth yeah. FM rates. Everyone's trying to work out, why is smooth so odd? So, oh, so, and my argument is because everyone else's content is so bland and awful. Mm -hmm. if, if every breakfast show is wacko, caco and the fucko bunch <laughs> and every, every PD, every content director, whatever the hell they're called now, creates the same old, same old and I'm angry about, well, I'll take your call, I'm angry too. And yet smooth is winning. How shit is your content, mate? Mm. Come on. It is extraordinary, isn't it? I'm glad. I mean, you've been in radio for decades and, and had, I think, one of the great shows on ABC. And it, it, it just amazes me that there are so many lacklustre talkback shows, uh, the morning drive, morning show, the drive show. They're all just picking you, You're little... putting shit on Neil now, mate. Well, well, no, 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 no. That's what I heard. No. I think we all heard that. Is, out the fr is that him out the front? Yeah, um, well, don't worry, he feels that. So, so you... Yeah, there's a little alarm that goes okay. off on his panel. I know, I know. So you've just mentioned something. Most people don't know what you're talking about. What do I do now? Mm. What do I do? Do I have to say who Neil is? Do I have to say where we are? Uh, <laughs> so I would, uh, right. because you go... but. The trick to that is to go, to not go, for the listeners, yeah, we're yeah. here at 3AW. You go, I know, I've got free space at 3AW and Neil Mitchell stalks the corridors like Nosferatu. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and we're away. You know, uh -huh. the morning host, Neil Mitchell. Blah. So you've got to give context and background. You've got to okay. fill in the colour without stopping the flow. And, and I'm not saying that's an easy thing because... That's a practice. It's a mm -hmm. practice. Think of it like surfing. You know, you're going to get up on the board and you're going to ride the wave and each wave is different and each moment of the connection with the wave is different and you're going to grow in skill. But this is what you're trying for. Seamless conversation where you follow in the background. The other thing that we haven't talked about is... Um, I've got another page of questions. Don't worry. Yeah, resetting. Ah. So roughly the length of a song, three and a half, four minutes... You should say who I am. Yes. I got so the, every, every three and a half, four minutes. It's a little bit different. Yeah, down the bottom of the page doesn't count. <laughs> it's a little bit different on a podcast, I guess, because people know what they're getting. But even so, if a rule of radio is I've just tuned in. Who the hell is this guy? What the hell are we doing? Great. And I'm out again. So so, so every now and then you, you've got to be going, yeah, we're chatting with Richard Stubbs and we're talking, what are we talking, Richard? All things about how to interview. And I go, yeah, I guess that's what we're talking right. about, Tim. So, so radio yeah, you've got to reset topics. Yeah, gotcha. Podcast, long-form podcast, which is like a 40-minute interview. I mean, I, I generally reset halfway. Is that just too long in? Oh, too? I would, yeah, I think so. Okay. It also gives you a little, um, it's a synchro to give you a gear change. Yeah. Think of it that way. Yes. When you reset and you go, and that's, you know, that's how my mum, you know, first shot me. Huh. <laughs> We're chatting with Richard Stubbs about interviews and uh, blah, 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 blah. So, mate, uh, ducks are funny. Right, got it. Well, okay, so reason. I can use it as synchro to shift from a topic that I've finished or that was heavy or light and then I want to shift into a heavy or light, the opposite topic. Got it. I use it for synchro for that. Okay. Uh, and do you say listeners? I always go listeners. Do Fuck you... no. no. I mean, gosh, no. Gosh, no, 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 no. Wow, what no. Do you, what do you say, Richard? You. You. What, when hey, did you, you use it in a sentence? Well, I'll tell you what I was just going to do then. I was going to okay. say, hey, listeners, we're talking to Richard Stubbs. No, you're. My, hey, you're You're, you're with. listening. You're with. You're with. You're talking to. Nice. You're talking to. I always felt awkward when I said listeners, but I had no other Well, options. because it makes it arm's length. I know. I'm not engaged. I'm not a listener. No, you're talking. Look, they're talking to me. We're all at the table. They're just sipping their cup of coffee, and they can't talk right now. Yeah. Got it. You're listening. Yeah, or you're talking Stubbs. with. 
You're talking with. They're talking. They're not talking with. Aren't they? Ah. Aren't they? Ah. He said with a squinted eye. Well, because to... if your interview is what it should be, you're talking they with... feel like they are. You're talking with Richard Stubbs. Yeah. They're going to go, no, I'm not. Yeah, but you I am are. because I'm part of the conversation. I'm just sitting like, my cup I, of tea. I get it. I get it. It's mate, not my fault you, if you're it... not good enough to create that, mate. You've got to strive for that. Uh-huh. Oh, well, hey, why are you here? Hey? You're That's the wind right. beneath my wings. Yeah. I mean, your greatest on. line on radio is surely you and I have something to talk about. Oh, okay, yes. True. Yeah, Are you yeah. proud of it? <laughs> you, I didn't really, uh, didn't really think about it like that. You, you, you were chatting about when I, I announced that I was going to uh, quit the ABC. You and I need to talk because on Friday I gave my resignation, and therefore this is one of the last times you and I are going to talk together on this show, on this station. Q gasp. Mate, it was beautiful. I mm. was driving. I almost cried. I mean, yeah. you know, it was beautiful. Well, it was honest. And, yeah, I suppose it is a good example of what I'm telling you. Yeah. About, that, that the – why does the medium of talking in its podcast or radio form still exist in 2018? Why isn't it just – just sound bites and digital and stories and stuff? And the the answer is the personal. Personal is universal. The private something else. The, the personal connection. If you – you need to make a personal connection with your listener. You need them to um, really, yeah, feel like they're in the room and they're connected and they care. Otherwise they don't care and they listen to something else. Radio is one of those uh, mediums where people can stop buying your product with the least amount of effort, except if you're at the ABC and where they'd ring up and say, I'm going to change channels. And I'd go, well, Good on you. And, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. well done. Baby steps. Try turning off light switches and opening fridge doors. You know, general stuff that everyone does without broadcasting it. It's yeah. all right, mate. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah. But everywhere except there, uh, people just change channel, change channel, change channel, like thought. So you need to hold them. So though you hold them through personal connection. And if you're going to do a long-form podcast and not make it so boring that someone's had a micro and gone into a tree, <laughs> then you need to make it. Connected. You need to make it to you. Mm -hmm. What could I be doing better right now to be more connected with my audience? Um, I guess, uh, I don't know. I, I, I guess... You do. It, it's about not talking to them, to the folk listening as if they're an audience. It's about just saying the you, the kitchen table. The, you know, are you interested at the kitchen table? You know, what's, what's going on? Yeah, okay. More of that. So you're not broadcasting to an arena. Yeah. You're broadcasting to a small group. You're so in a car it, talking or something it's with a someone else in the car. mindset shift, isn't it? Like you've really got to go away from the fact that we're in a studio, there's microphones, mm -hmm. I'm with someone I don't really know, yep. I am trying not to be an announcer, I'm there's trying There's a third person to, here as well. There's someone, a third person. There's that old thing. <laughs> yes, panel operator. Uh, you know, we've got, there's a whole lot of stuff that mm. us amateurs have to forget about. Yeah, it's called pretendies. Pretendies. Yeah, so the role <laughs> of the interviewer is to get you to forget all those things. Right. Uh, the joy of uh, podcasts and radio is it's not TV, so there's not lights and camera on you. Often um, uh, TV channels would say, oh, can we film your interview with uh, Mel Gibson uh, while they're in it? And the radio would go, yeah, that would be great. And I'd go, no. No. So why would I say no? Well, because, God, Mel Gibson's hard enough. He's not, actually, he's a lovely interview, you know, unless you mention a few sensitive topics. Um, uh, but uh, he's hard enough. He's had a million interviews, right? To, if you can get anything that's different to every other interview, it's going to be about make it conversational, get him to relax, have a throw some left field stuff in that he bites at and away you go. All of that stops the minute the cameras go on. The lights come up and the camera's on. So I would always say no because the content for my program is going to be less and I don't care about anything else. So, Got it. You, you did uh, a Tonight Show on Channel 9. You uh, have, so Channel 7. Channel 7, was it? Yeah, Tonight Live. You, you have uh, you've done that. You've done your radio. Uh, the interviewing, how does it differ and which do you prefer? Uh, yeah, it really it differs a lot. So I did uh, over 120 Tonight Shows, I guess. Wow. And um, so obviously it's a lot shorter. You, the whole process is shorter. 
Um, I'd meet the guest. Uh, usually, I would meet the guest prior to the show. Sometimes it wasn't possible. They were coming from their own show and they arrived, you know, and I met them for the first time. Uh, it was a little fraught. But usually I'd meet them briefly and just get a sense of them. And then it's on live and you've got that safe cracker thing. Everything I was talking about is increased because you've got a couple of minutes to get the best out of them. Mm -hmm. Mm. And So it's more frenetic. As the interviewer, I mean, I'm doing a little bit of radio myself and I feel like I'm always shortchanging the guest and the audience, those people listening, because you can't, you don't have the luxury of here we are, we'll go for as long as it needs to be, not a second more. Mm. Whereas with a radio interview or TV, what have you got? Three, four, five minutes? Yeah. And it's just constantly like you know there's more to explore. Well, and the annoying thing is, yes, uh, and then you make choices. So three minutes in and Tim's mentioned he, you know, did a gig for Nelson Mandela. So do we stop and talk about that? And then we were, but we'll burn time and we won't get to the thing. And this is why everything goes long and the person at the end of the show is always squeezed, you know, the, um, yeah. because that's how it yeah. goes. Yes, you've got to make choices uh, in your head about uh, where you're going to spend the time. Is yeah. this worth the time? comes back to that thing of, is this the best thing I can put to air? Yeah, okay. It's a, it's a big rule to always keep in your mind. Is this the best thing I can put to air? If it isn't, why am I putting it to air? We're talking with you and I are talking with Richard Stubbs, legendary Australian comedian, TV presenter, radio host. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Richard, I go into every interview with one big question that I am determined to get answered. Like the big question for this chat is how do you nail an interview with an expert? Okay, and that's how I'm going to headline the interview in the blog. That's how I'm going to promote the interview. Um, I will go other. I want to go other places, but there's that one big question that I always want to get answered. Is that a good idea? No, oh, yeah, Maybe. works for you. I, 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 I don't ever go into interviews with big preconceptions unless it's okay. Well, Tim's coming in here and he's just you know landed the plane safely. I think we need to talk about that, right? So uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I guess I approach interviews a bit more open. What I've done, say it's a. Depending on who it is, like if it's a movie star, then I've looked at their bio and I'm trying to pick out unusual things. Or what I can look at the timeline and go, I think I feel that was pivotal, that choice and stuff like that. And okay. um, Or I might, uh, if it's like a veteran, I might talk about, I'd look at the same things and go, well, what, what would that experience be like for me? What would I think when, you know, the machine gun opened up or whatever? What, oh, that must have been. And then I'll reflect that to them mm -hmm. and see how they jump, which way. Yeah, okay. Um, but the big question things are, sure, why not? It gives you a, a focus, a goal. Yeah. Nothing, there's no, I'm not, I don't think I'm that dictator about the rules. Well, I, I think when I, as I asked that, I was realising that part of that is this thing called search engine optimization, which you probably have absolutely no interest in. But Google, you know, I if there's some interest in so maybe a little bit of Who is the best comedian in Australia? I want to rank for that, says <laughs> yeah, Richard. That's right. But, you know, um, Google uh, will rank this interview if it knows what it's about. Mm. So if I if I promote this interview around one big question, then it's pretty clear what it's about. Yeah. If it's yeah. That's but it's all about Google. I, I don't suppose. Think, I don't know. Is it? Mm. You are who Google says you are. I know, right? And uh, the, it's the hits that are everything. So. <laughs> Correct. Who's the other Richard Stubb in the world that Stubbs in the world that kind of gets in your way? I have a Tim Reed who is a, an actor out of America. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's Completely nice. Completely gets in my way. <laughs> is there another Richard Stubbs? I don't think so. Uh, but yeah, there's uh, yeah, yeah, there's Vanderbilt. There was one when I was growing up. I remember getting blamed for trashing his daughter's party, and I'm like, <laughs> dude, I don't even get invited. I'd... What? What if your guest isn't putting in? Yeah, yeah. Two choices. Um, first of all, uh, three choices. Struggle on. Uh, stop and go, mate, you're not into this. Uh, what's going on? Because your interview's good. Yeah. I've, I've said it. Go, oh, mate, are you into this? Uh, I, I've actually said, hey, mate, uh, I had a guy ring uh, who, was, who uh, didn't come for the interview that I'd promoted and then rang me off air to say he was held up, so I put it to air and said, mate, what are you doing? Oh, well, I got caught up. I said, mate, you're in a 300-seater venue. I'm trying to sell tickets for you. Why is it good enough that you don't come in for the interview and then you just phone me? Why is this all right? And so that's, that's like all that. tense that's and real. awkward. 
It's awkward. Yeah, Shit, yeah. right. But I'll guarantee no one switched the da- channel. No one. Whereas if you just said, oh, they couldn't make it because, oh, well, that's all. So, so, <laughs> then they would have. But so that's your second choice. You go, mate, you're not feeling this. What's going on? What's up, Tiger? What's Food? up with you? Food? Uh, third thing is, and that's all we've got time for. Thanks uh, very much. Ah, right. You just go, there was a great interview. Uh, Sky News did it. I'm going to talk to the minister about so-and-so. Well, I've already said my position about so-and-so and and I've been very clear, so I'll say nothing more. Thanks, we'll leave it there and moving on. (laughs) Bang, that's it. And that was so cool. People were like, ooh, and I'm like, no, you've got to drive the bus. It's your interview. It's not their opportunity to free publicise whatever the hell they want. So it's your call. So I think you've got three. Struggle on, think, oh, maybe I can edit it together. But I always feel put upon. So I tend not to do that. I tend to go, mate, what's going on? <laughs> you don't seem happy. What? Is it me? Is it you? How many times you? have you had to do that? No, I don't know. Um, I'm always ready for it. I'm right, always yeah. bang up for it because I go, <laughs> oh, this will be cool. Yeah. <laughs> this will be interesting. And uh, and I can and I have just ended interviews. I go, oh, mate, look, nah. The great ABC interviewer Richard Feidler from the Conversation Hour tells the story. He's only ever done it once where he... It's an hour conversation. Mm. It's called The Conversation Hour. It's brilliantly named program. Mm. Uh, And he's broken into two halves. He he just wants to do the one interview. But if in approaching the 30-minute mark, he goes, this is not working. He looks at his producer and says, we're going to cut this. Well, there's some hand signal. And then they've got a, an old interview ready to go for the next half an hour. So he's only have to do that, had to do that once. Mm. But He's got his backup ready. Backup ready. Well, Break the glass. Look, it comes back to best content. Yeah. Okay, this rule, I know I'm harping back to it, but it really is just the litmus test of everything that you put to air in a podcast or radio. Is this the best? Are you bored? If you're bored, how do you reckon the listener is? Yeah. And I'm using the singular because there's only one left. So <laughs> so do something about that. Don't put up with bad content, bottom line. Stop it, throw a curveball, uh, do something, but don't just, oh, well, that was boring and awful and you're listening to the Boring and Awful podcast. <laughs> like, why, why do that? Life's Correct. too short for bad content. Correct. Uh who is the interviewer that you admire the most in this world, past or present? Um, it's an interesting question. I don't really think of it like that, I guess. I um, Graham Norton seems to get great conversations out in a really short period of time. Doesn't he? In a very kind of seamless manner. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that. It's like it doesn't look like that he's done anything. They're, and all, yet, they're all drinking. Mm, maybe. Are they? I don't know. Sometimes it makes it worse. Mm-hmm. Don't worry, I've been on live TV and I've looked at someone and realised their eyes can't focus. And that's not a good feeling. Not a good feeling. Oh. Is that a guest? Yeah, yeah. No, I've had a couple of guests like that. I had one guest, uh, you talked about, uh, she's a 90s pop star, and she's come on and she is full of drugs like a chemist shop and just her eyes are pinning and I'm just like... Oh. So hard, and I, and I ripped into the uh, record company people who had brought her there afterwards because this is live national TV, and I got this uh, useless lump, and uh, it's awkward because uh, one of the record people ends up being my partner, and oh, she no. still recalls it. No, no, no. Yeah, which I feel is unfair, but uh, you know. Well, she brought you together, this '90s diva. Well, uh, we'd actually worked together before, but over the years in different radio stations. But yeah, no, nah, that. Uh... So your Graham Norton thing is interesting because hmm. he does it does seem seamless. He's, I think he's incredibly he just pops... camp. Yeah, well, he... whatever. I I don't. He is what he is. I I just like that he has a seamless way of getting everyone to relax and share and and be the style of the show, and it looks like he's done nothing to do that. And mm. and so I, because that's not true, because there is a huge amount of artifice in getting that, that vibe happening and working it, um, and he also, if something's not working, he kind of jumps on it as well, which I like. Yes, so yeah, I, I like all that front footing. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like in business. You've got a front foot issues with clients. You've got a front foot um, an issue that's coming up. You can't pretend it doesn't exist. You can't hide it. 
you've got to get in there and, and straight away, oh, look, before we get started, let's deal with that, you know, the factory's on fire. Let's just talk about that for a moment. Like, you've got to front foot. If you can't front foot it, mm, you're in big trouble. There's a couple of words in, in the world of marketing and business, authenticity and transparency, which sound they, they do sound wanky and overused, but they, they do also ring very true because if you're not that, I feel like you're going to get caught out, you know? Yeah, sure. So, so that's your reason for doing it, mate. Correct. Because you might get caught out if you don't. <laughs> well, maybe that's not. A, it's a blurry moral compass, well, it's it's isn't a, it, Tim? Yeah, I just a... like to be. It's my being all transparent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because otherwise, they might catch me. <laughs> Correct. It's oh, an interesting way to look. Well, at it. can we edit that out? <laughs> Tell me, uh, I have I run into this all the time. Where a minute we turn the mics off, the guest then opens up. Yeah. yeah. Did that happen to you? Oh man, I. Uh... I'm just like, really. Who are those flogs? Uh, easy like Sunday morning. Oh, yeah. Faith No More. Um, who is it? Sorry? Faith No More. Uh, yeah, Faith No More. So Faith No More are on Tonight Live and the band's uh, setting up in the ad break and I've wandered over to them off my set and wandered over to them and I'm having a chat to the guys and they're all friendly and I was like, oh, great, and they're yeah, chatting about, you know, oh, the band and they're great and you got your tour on. And, uh, and we're back. Red light up, two, three. And I'm standing here, yeah, uh, and we're back when we're standing here with uh, Faith No More and Joy. So, guys, how's things? Right up. It's like the singing frog. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Says so someone's looking. Right up. And I'm like, Sue. Uh, and I'm, I kept going for longer than I normally do <laughs> yeah. because. This is live. Yeah, we're in live national now. Because minutes ago they were chatting and we were all getting out like a house on fire. As soon as the red light went on, they went, oh. and I'm like, two. <laughs> Why'd you do Sunday? Easy. Why that one of the Commodores? <laughs> uh, and, oh, okay, well, uh, here they are. And, you know, I got it right up. Oh, look at yeah. this. Die your death. <laughs> Try to bond. I'm like, oh, we'll punch them right in the face. If <laughs> yeah, I see yeah, Faith yeah, no yeah. more again, you will get hit by my car. Yeah, yeah so uh, for, those ones. For, for me, it's They not, change. So, well, they do change. Some people, I mean, bringing people in here, again, who aren't mm. used to being uh, interviewed, mm. they, I don't know why I said interviewed that way. It was quite awkward. But, um, you know, bringing people into a studio environment immediately, they might see Neil Mitchell and they just shut down. They go, yeah, which, most people do. So I kind of, again, pre-interview, you come into a radio studio, mm-hmm. you might see someone you know, that's cool, it's fun, so I kind of got to make sure that they don't freeze. But but what I do find is that once the microphone's turned off, they go, oh, you know, there was that time too where we, we made a million bucks in a day. I forgot to tell you about that. And I'm like, really? How do I avoid that? Am I obviously just got to, I've got to be better researched maybe. Yeah, Damn. have a nasty feeling you just answered your own yeah, question. Yeah, thank you. For Look, if, uh, two things here. Um, never turn the microphones off. Like, always be rolling. Mm-hmm. Uh, until they get up and leave the room, always be rolling. Because you can edit it back in and you can do yeah. all sorts of things. If they say it, it's there. So once once they walk in, start rolling. Uh, don't stop rolling until they leave. Don't mm-hmm. go, and we're finished. And then the so because occasionally that'll happen, and also if it's happening regularly, get better at interviewing. Why? The, why is the gold left Correct. behind? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it doesn't, I, happen. doesn't happen all the time. Might be one in twenty. It's all right, mate. No, no need no, to get defensive. No, 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 we can no, all no, get better. No. Uh, I'm hearing you. Your body yeah. language has shifted, and yeah. you're, you're looking down and you're frowning. It's all right. It's all well, right, little buddy. The, the, Go the, back to the wave okay. analogy. You're yeah. surfing. <laughs> you don't ride a perfect wave every time. <laughs> but honestly, if you go, doctor, it keeps hurting when I do this. The answer is, well, stop doing that. Right. If they keep putting the best stuff after you've finished, then there's something wrong with the way you're getting the stuff out. Yeah, okay. Let me just break it to you that way. Well, mate, hey, this is why I got you in. Which brings us to the end, which is a part of an interview that, again, I struggle a little bit with, Mm -hmm. which is how to end. Now, past guest and an old mate, Jules Lund from Getaway, who's done a lot of TV, a lot of little short video segments. He says, Timbo, you've got to have a great in and a great out because then the rest can kind of sort itself out in the middle. And I just haven't quite (laughs) got that out yet. Do I go, Richard Stubbs, thank you so much for taking us inside the art of an interview. See you later. Uh, Yeah, nothing wrong with that. What's what's the... What's the? I'm not sure what your problem is though. What? How are you ending? And so, well, okay. Well, call me. Is that what? How are you ending? 
I, sometimes I do what I just did then, although okay. I don't use Richard Stubbs because it'll be someone else. Yeah, it'll so be they've got a different name. Otherwise, yeah. Uh, but what I also do is my, I might just go, you know, because I what I didn't say is the mindset that I go in, in, in an interview with, and the reason I do this is because I'm in awe of small business owners. I really I think their courage uh, is amazing. Mm. and they inspire me. So often at the end of an interview, like last week's one, I go, you know what? What you have done to start a blog and then three years down the track have a $20 million business, I think is nothing short of inspiring. Thanks for being on the show. It worked. Didn't have it written, but that's how I felt at the end. Sometimes I just don't have that ending. I know what the answer is. Because you're not that inspired. (laughs) <laughs> well, and, uh, sometimes I'm not. Well, that's been a line and length and a little beige. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm feeling that. So, well, and I'm not sure what your question is really because I... um, are you asking me how do I finish off those interviews where I wasn't emotionally invested? No, not necessarily emotionally invested. I just think, do you finish off an interview the same way every time and should I just write down what my ad is and just use it? Thank you, you've been great. Or? Uh, I... I would... I think what we've talked about today is is about listening and about unique content and about all that stuff. So if you're writing down the way you say goodbye to someone, <laughs> then I think talk, I have to say to you, out. don't do that. Right. Because God forbid you look down at your notes to read it <laughs> yeah, correctly. <right. laughs> and And that's awful. So I think you just uh, finish with whatever you feel and you pick up one aspect of the conversation. You go, man, that's been fantastic. I'm going to think a lot about blah, blah, blah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, don't forget this and all our other podcasts. Tell your friends. They're free. Download them. Right. So you, you do your... Yeah, okay. You do your tail, yeah, which you is it. a plug for the thing, and hit got up the you. websites and tell your friends. Send this everywhere. Richard, I'm a big fella. I said to you at the start of this mm. interview that um, I would love you to pull me up on things that uh, I get wrong or could do better. You haven't, uh, but we're going about to wrap things up. Well, I have. I don't up. think you listen. I yeah. I, right. I think I did a lot, but you're not listening. But. Wow, there you go. That's great. <laughs> Listen more. <laughs> oh, I hear that a lot. <laughs> really? Do you do anything about it? No, I just hear it. They're yelling at me all the time. I don't know. It's just noise. <laughs> okay. Listen more. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, look, that that is now, the now thing. Now you're freaking for, me out. That is the thing for every interview. Um, uh, listen. Listen to what people say. I, I know it sounds like, yeah, of course, but you can have your little questions written and you can be ready to move on to the thing. But the way to progress is to look at those, look at what the, the answer you're given, play with that a little bit, segue it into your next question, slide your next question out of the running order, back down three places because now you're going to segue somewhere else. Make sure you come back to it. That's all kind of the duck under the water paddling mm-hmm. while calm on the surface type thing. Yes. I'm, yep. I'm big on analogies. I like analogies. You do like analogies. I'm the king of them, I think. All right. All right. Listen more. I've got another interview, so I'll have to go and practice my listening. It's a hell of a day, mate. Big day, mate. Oh, Richard, no. thank you so much for taking... T- <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. What? Uh, nothing. What? No, that's as no, no, sincere as I've the... ever got. That's... I just I just finished the interview. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the gist Richard, of it. thank you for taking us inside the art of the interview because it's something that I have struggled with for a long time and I feel I'm going to be better for it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, too. <laughs> oh, I could not do that, seriously. <laughs> After all that, I stuff up the clothes. Oh, boy. Told you I was a fanboy. There you go, Richard Stubbs. A bit of an update. I gave Richard a copy of my book, as I do with all my guests, and he texted me yesterday asking if I'd help him with his content marketing. Of course, I said no. (laughs) No, I didn't. said yes. Happy days. Look forward to doing that. I would love Richard to podcast. I think he'd be fantastic. So if I can help him do that, I think we're all in for a treat. Coming up, I share my top three attention grabbers from that fireside chat with Richard. Plus, I'll show you how to exponentially increase your customer base. Cash flow in business is everything, right? That's why I'm excited to introduce you to Prosper, Australia's number one online lender to Aussie small businesses. But don't take my word for it. Small business owner Nioli Scobie of Truly Tea won the contract to supply the Opera House and needed to quickly ship tens of thousands of tea bags and two tonnes of loose leaf tea. Where was she going to get the money for that? 
Well, I already supplied part of the Opera House and then they offered me inside the Opera House, which is a very big deal, and I had to have a lot of stock on hand. They place an order, they want it the next day, and I wasn't going to say no to them. I'd knocked back too many opportunities in the past, so I phoned up a, a finance guy I trusted. He said, look, there's a new player on the market, Prosper, give them a call. I gave them a call and within 24 hours I had the money in the bank. <laughs> Prosper, P R O S. PA. That's where she got the money. Apply online in 10 minutes to borrow up to $250,000. Call 1-300-882-867 or visit prosper.com forward slash Timbo. This show is also made possible thanks to American Express Business Explorer credit card. A card that lets your business expenses reward you. I asked Amex member Chris Gray, CEO of property buying business Your Empire, how he benefits from using his Amex. I use Amex for the whole of my business. Literally every single thing I pay in my business, even down to effectively my staff or my contractors and my rent at home, everything goes on the Amex card. Because with Amex, you get the most points for your dollar spent. And I convert those points into frequent flyer rewards points. I fly 10 or 15 times a year, only business and first class, including those beautiful A380 suites you get on Singapore Airlines where you get your own bedroom. And I fly for free. I don't pay for a single flight. But it's not all upside. Or is it? So I've got a, I've still got a million points because I spend so much money in my business. I've then got to pre-plan 10 trips for next year of where do I want to go? I need to find excuses to go to different countries. <laughs> this is a massive first world problem, Chris. It is, but I'm willing to put up with it. So there's, there's very few people that can, uh, can force themselves through the pain barrier, but I'm willing to do it. I've trained myself. <laughs> New American Express card members who apply and spend $3,000 in the first three months from the card approval date receive a bonus 100,000 membership rewards points. Ah, you got to love it when your business expenses reward you. Search Amex Business to find out how. New American Express card members only. Offer ends November 30, 2017. Terms and conditions apply. Ha! I always wanted to do that. My top three attention grabbers from my chat with Aussie media personality Richard Stubbs, thanks to American Express and Prosper. Attention grabber number one. I love this quote from Richard. Whatever you're doing on air should be the best thing you've got to be on air right now, end quote. Love that. Attention grabber number two, listen more. So need to do that. I know I interrupted him a couple of times on that interview. I know, don't write to me and tell me. But I was a bit excited. I needed to kind of probe and press and find out more. But um, I'll get better at it. I've only been doing it for 392 interviews, so give me a break. Attention grab at number three, use the reset to shift gears. I love this. So to move from the from a current topic to the next topic, always reset. Tell people, uh, tell listeners, tell you uh, who you're interviewing, why you're interviewing them, and then move on to the next topic. That's the good old reset hack. And I've got a fourth one too. Uh, life's too short for bad content. Uh, I saw a quote the other day. I agree with what Richard says there. I saw a great quote which says, when it comes to content marketing, noise is not the problem, sameness is. So if you're going to embark on a content marketing strategy. If you're going to interview people, make those interviews different to ones that you might hear elsewhere. That's what grabbed my attention. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 392 and let me know what grabbed yours. What have you got to lose? It's time for one simple yet effective marketing idea that you can implement immediately. One that won't cost a fortune and that might just generate you more awareness, more inquiry and ultimately more sales. I call today's idea the how to become besties with your brand's influencers hack. It's inspired by my recent interview with Stu Greger, the creator of Four Pillars Gin, who does this really, really well. Every business, including yours, has a group of people who have the ability to exponentially increase its customer base. 
Us marketing wankers call them brand influencers. They have the attention and respect of people that you'd love to get in front of and often in quantities that you'd kill for. For my podcast business, having the Small Business Big Marketing Show available in flight on Virgin Australia has been a game changer. For my speaking business, ensuring that key personnel from speakers bureaus know about my keynote and emceeing skills, (laughs) or lack thereof, Uh, which means that I get plenty of conference work. And having my blog posts appear on small business association websites like the Small Business Mentoring Service has increased my website traffic by multiples. But partnerships like these don't just happen. They require upfront work and ongoing nurturing. So here's my three steps to becoming besties with your brand's influences. Step one, make a list of 20 people more if you like, and or businesses that you'd love to have talk glowingly about your business. Step two, for each one on that list, get crystal clear on what it is you'd like them to do for you. And just as, if not more importantly, get clear on what you can do for them. And step three, send each one a personalised handwritten note of introduction together with your product. If you're a service provider, that's cool. Then this could be a voucher that you send to them for them to try out your services. And here's the pro tip, team. Follow each one up. Don't just send and forget hoping that everyone will call you with gushing, oh, thank you for that. They won't. The money is in the way you follow up. That's my three steps to becoming besties with your brand's influencers. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 392 where you'll find a link to this post plus some additional resources to bring this idea to life, including some tips on how to reach out to influencers so they can't say no and a link to purchase a signed copy of my book, The Boomerang Effect, that is a pretty solid chapter on the way you can go about bringing this idea to life. So, what have you got to lose? Do you need a speaker for your next conference? Recommend Timbo to your event organiser. Or better still, book him. Tim Reid, that's R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U. Alrighty, you and I cover some serious marketing ground in this show. Have you listened to the chat I had with Orbit Key inventor Rex Quo? He used crowdfunding to raise money for his invention and exceeded his target by a whopping 3,000%. I think we raised about 16,000 on the first day. You know, I, I joked to Charles and I said, hey, you know, like, um, what, would we, what would it take for you to quit your job to, uh, to, and to do this full time? And, he, you know, he, he said $200,000. And, you know, that was still on the first day. And, you know, we just laughed at it. We're like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> and then near the, at the end of the campaign, sure enough, we, you know, we reached $200,000. And then you know, we quit our jobs and we, we went over to, uh, you know, over to China. We lived there for three to four months just to get the product made. If you have an idea for a product or service and need to raise some funds, then you are going to love that chat with Rex as he goes on to explain the key components of a successful crowdfunding campaign. And it's not as hard as you think. A couple of little things you've got to do well, but yeah, it's a good idea, to, good, good way to raise funds. Hey, I'd love to hear from you. Hit the contact button over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com where you can email me, connect with me on social media, grab a signed copy of my book, The Boomerang Effect. Be sure to check out the American Express Business Explorer card. If you love the idea of your business expenses rewarding you, go and search Amex Business after the show's over. And check out Prosper, P-R-O-S-P-A. Australia's number one online lender to small businesses. You can quickly apply online for loans up to $250,000, get a fast decision, and in most cases, receive the funding in under 24 hours. Uh, Visit prosper.com forward slash Timbo or give them a buzz. 1300 882 867. Tell them Timbo sent you. If you love the small business big marketing show, then let another business owner know about it by grabbing their phone and downloading it for them. Until next week, I'm Timbo Reid. Thanks for tuning in to the small business big marketing show. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.